Today's reading of the chalice lighting is As We Travel in Unknown Lands by Barnaby Fetter. We kindle a flame we trust will lead us forward as we travel in unknown lands. Where the question, shall I ever get there, resounds. A clear, pure note in every silence. Our opening hymn this morning is Morning Has Come. For those in the sanctuary, please sit back and enjoy the hymn, but please do not sing along. How she found out about our church. And I have been here since the mid nineties. I found out about this church because of the existential crisis with my, my daughter, who was 16 at the time, and I found um, a very good family with the spirituality and support I needed to deal with this time, and I have been here ever since. Thank you. Howdy. Sandy, um, 
moved here from the and um and I am in some spiritual food that's non-denominational. And I just loved it when I went to the site and I saw that rainbow of people that are volunteer. That's really important to me in my life. And I love that you care about the humans and I love that you care about the environment. So that's why I'm here. Thank you. If there's any, oh, is there anyone else? Oh, sorry. <laughs> Hi, my name is Marcus. I'm a Good newcomer. I was separated uh, from church a long time ago. Um, I've done about 30 years of comparative theology now and finally made a decision on Unitarian. I'm also still a practicing Druid and the two match up really well. And it was really the works of Robert Fulton when I was reading all I didn't know I learned from kindergarten stuff like that made me have a big interest in you. Thank you. Thank you, welcome. Is there anyone else uh, like to introduce themselves? No. Okay. Um, is there anyone online who would like to introduce themselves? Hey, thank you for joining us. For new guests, our visitor's book is in the parish hall. So please um, sign it before you leave so that you are here and can let us we can so that we can let you know about coming upcoming events for those online the best way to get added to the mailing list is to email the church office at admin at uuchurchofriverside.org during the service we will mention several websites email addresses and phone numbers at the end of the service we will leave up a slide with all this information and it is also available on our website Joys and concerns. Sharing joys and concerns is one of the important rituals in our community. And it's an opportunity to share milestones, losses, achievements, and experiences with one another. Now that our doors are open again on the first Sunday of each month, we can both hear from those in the sanctuary and read the contributions we have received. Also in front of the pulpit, there is a book where you can write your joys and concerns whenever you are here in the sanctuary. For those of you at home, you can send your joys and concerns throughout the month to uuchurchofriverside at gmail.com. Our next, next joys and concerns will be on September 5th. The monthly UUCR newsletter comes out the first of every other month by email and per request by postal mail. If you have something you feel is newsworthy or would like to contribute, please email uuchurchofriverside.calendar at gmail.com or call the church office at 951-686-6515. If you would like to be added to our mailing list, please contact the church office. The City of Riverside COVID-19 website tells us, California is making sure vaccine dose doses are distributed and administered equitably. While experts continually learn more about the protection vaccines and other health measures provide, it is important to keep using all the tools available to help our community slow the spread. This includes wearing masks, washing hands, maintaining a healthy diet and regular exercise, staying six feet apart when feasible and regular testing. For vaccine information, go to vaccineca.com or covid19.ca.gov. Let's all 
take personal responsibility to protect ourselves and others because we are all in this together. Vax it and mask it. Um, for additional announce announcements, um, the Social Environmental Justice Committee um, has put out a basket, a turquoise basket out in the parish hall. And um, this is to collect donations uh, to help the disadvantaged in our community. Please donate non-perishable food and hygiene items and usable clothing as you are willing and able. Thank you very much. Also, today is the blue moon. We have a full moon tonight. And Linda Van Boris is hosting a full moon drum circle tonight at 6.30 p.m. in Pat Kawander's backyard. So if you have any questions, please ask either Linda or Pat. We hope to see you there. There will be snacks, I believe. Um, everyone is uh, welcome to bring snacks. And um, we hope to see you there. Our next hymn is Spirit of Life. If you are in the sanctuary, please sit back, close your eyes, and enjoy. This portion of our service is to support our beloved historical church and our local community. This can be accomplished in several ways. You may send your check to the church office, which will be shown. You may contribute using the QR code, which is on the church website and also in the newsletter. And it's also on your order of service that you were given when you came in. Stater Brothers Market gives our church a rebate on Stater Brothers grocery cards, and we will have those, I will have those in church each Sunday. Just to repeat what Grace said, prior to the COVID shutdown, we accepted donations for the food insecure. We're resuming this, or we have resumed this with the able assistance of Adam Weta King, our social justice chairperson. You can bring donations to the little free pantry, which is outside on Lemon Street, just over here at the side of the church. 
it is suggested you bring food items which are easy to open, such as pop top cans. Rice and other staple items can also be contributed. And again, the purple or the turquoise bin out in the parish hall, you can put your items in there also. Would our ushers please come forward to receive our collection? is from you I receive. Please sit back quietly and enjoy. Now I'd like to turn the pulpit over to Joan de Artemis, who will be leading the rest of the service. Thank you. Thank you, Grace. Our meditation today is by Marnie Harmony. If on a starlit, a starlit night, with the moon brightly shimmering, we stay inside and do not venture out. The evening universe remains a part of life we shall not know. <clears throat> if on a cloudy day, with grayness infusing all and rain dancing rivers in the grass, we stay inside and do not venture out. The stormy, threatening energy of the universe remains a part of life we will not know. If on a frosty morning, treading the chilling air before sunrise, we stay inside and do not venture out, the awesome cold, quiet, and stillness of the dawn universe remains a part of life we shall not know. If throughout these grace-given days of ours, surrounded as we are by green life and brown death, hot pink joy and cold gray pain and miracles, <clears throat> always miracles. If we stay inside and do not venture out, then the fullness of the universe shall be unknown to us and our locked hearts shall never feel the rush 
of worship. Let us pause for a moment of silence. <clears throat> Many years ago, my spouse, Kathy, had a conversation with a mutual friend of ours. And when Kathy said something about her reason for being here, meaning, you know, alive on the planet, our friend responded, oh, I don't think there's any reason for me being here. I think I'm just here to take up space. Years later, I am still surprised by this response, not only because the statement was made in the context of a spirituality group that the three of us were a part of, but also because it just doesn't make sense to me. Now, I get the Buddhist concept of letting go of desire. I totally get that. But even practicing Buddhists, I believe, have some sort of purpose, which they are in pursuit of. In my opinion, we all, whether we are aware of it or not, have some kind of thing, concept, idea, value that we pursue our entire life and some of us are aware of it but probably most of us aren't but just because we aren't aware of something it doesn't mean that it doesn't exist this purpose i like to call our great quest and it is different literally for everyone Now, our friend who was just taking up space, she has a spouse with a very fragile medical condition who she has been caring for literally for years and years. And my guess is if she were to eventually reach total self-awareness at the end of her life, maybe, she might say something like, my great quest was just to make sure that my wife has the longest and best life that I can possibly give her. She might say something like that. I don't know because we haven't actually been in touch for years, but you know, she might. I know what mine is. Mine is to find and keep a really great compatible spouse, to have a career that allows me to do something that is more important than just make more profit for some billionaire somewhere, and to leave the world just a little bit better place when I die that it would have been had I never lived. At 65, I am happy to report that a lot of my great quest has been achieved. I do have that great compatible spouse. Kathy and I have been a couple now for 28 years. We just celebrated our anniversary. And even though when I was younger, I wasn't always aware that a really great compatible spouse was what I was looking for. In hindsight, yeah, 
It really was. Career-wise, this is my fourth and final career. I've had a lot of jobs that I hated. And looking back, I realized that there were a lot of jobs that fed me body and soul. But most of the other ones only fed my body. I know for a fact that making billionaires richer does not feed my soul. And I've spent years of my life listening to my soul cry out for nourishment before I found some way to sustain it. Ministry does that. The last one, well, <clears throat> the jury is still out on that one. I do try every day to do more good than harm. We'll see how that works out at the end. Someone else will be the judge of that, not me. This is what you get when you have someone come and speak at your church who is equally passionate about both theology and gaming. My personal theology is totally influenced by my gaming and vice versa. I really love something called fantasy role-playing games. Games like Dungeons and Dragons, Pathfinder, World of Darkness. My current obsession is World of Warcraft. It was through playing Dungeons and Dragons many years ago that I first realized that there were other options open to me about my, you know, my religious expression, besides the American Baptist Church that I used to be a member of. The world of Dungeons and Dragons is a polytheistic one where gods and demons are totally real. You can interact with them in a real way. And different people make different choices in accordance with their character's personal needs or their own personal needs. This revelation first led me to paganism and then to Unitarian Universalism. Fantasy role-playing games are all more or less based on the works of J.R.R. Tolkien. So like in the Lord of the Rings trilogy, there is a complex interlaced narrative that includes a kind of a main quest with several involved side quests woven in along the way. Tolkien didn't invent this literary model. It, you just look at the Iliad and the Odyssey, they're the same way. But even though the style in these works may differ, the complex interlaced quest narrative is present in both. One of the reasons I think that all of these literary models have survived for so long is that they speak to people in a kind of a deep subconscious, maybe even unconscious way. So whenever we are trying to understand the meaning of life for ourselves, as humans tend to do, we have a tendency to frame, to frame that meaning as one long quest interlaced with a series of successful or unsuccessful side quests. So let's test this theory, shall we? Take a moment and think about something that you wanted, that you worked for, and you achieved. It could be anything. This is your quest, you make the rules. Okay, got it? Now think about how thinking about that achievement makes you feel. Now take a moment and think about something else. Think about something you wanted, worked for, and failed to achieve. 
How does thinking about that make you feel? Now, think about something else. Think about something you wanted, you worked for, and you failed at, but it turned out to be okay. Maybe even the best thing. Because of why. What made it okay? If you don't know or haven't thought about what your personal great quest is, it will be in those fails, not fails, that you will find the most informative clues. I'll give you another personal example. In 1979, I trained to be an animal keeper at the LA Zoo. I was working in aerospace at the time, like my dad before me, and I was feeding my body, but not my soul. So I discovered that there was a training program at the LA Zoo for people who wanted to become animal keepers. And I took it. And there were four openings that year, 200 applicants. And oh, how I wanted that job. I went to class one night per week for an entire semester after working 10 hours a day at work. Plus to get experience, I worked as a volunteer keeper on Sundays after working six days at my other job. At the end, I had to take both, I had to take a written civil service test plus a physical agility test, a skills test, and an oral exam. Did I mention how very, very badly I wanted this job? In the end, I finished eighth out of 200 applicants, which isn't bad, right? Except that there's only four openings. I was devastated. Really, I cried for days. I became very despondent. I felt like I was never, ever going to have a job that nourished my soul. So there was no point in ever trying again any longer. I was just done. It was around that time that I first heard the saying, life is hard, then you die. And by that point, I totally believed it. I totally, that was my philosophy. But now, in the fullness of time, I have come to realize that the great zookeeper adventure was but a side quest, necessary as an engine for my story, but never meant to really be a success. You see, if I had gotten that job, I would have probably stayed there until at least the the late 90s, which is about when my arthritis got too bad for me to do that kind of physical work anymore. Then I probably would have just retired. And all of that would have been, been fine, except I never would have met my really great compatible spouse. You see, I was so miserable after failing to get my dream job that I made a bunch of other changes because it's easier to make changes when you don't care, I guess. But these were changes that need to be made that, and I probably wouldn't have made them if I had been ha happy. Nothing drives change more than misery. One of those changes was coming out as a lesbian. And while I, that certainly could have happened while I was working at the zoo 
it most definitely would not have happened in the same way. And there's a good chance it would not have led me to meeting my spouse when I did. That plus a whole lot of things that happened along the way. The see, the, what seemed like at the time, the worst possible thing that could have happened was actually the best. And you would not believe how often I draw upon that zookeeper training in ministry. What I'm saying here is stay fluid, go with the flow. Be aware that you don't know everything. And in fact, in the grand scheme of things, there is really very, very little that you do know. One of my favorite sayings is upstairs has a plan. I just haven't got the memo yet. By upstairs, what I mean is my higher power in a kind of a 12 step kind of way. I realize that there are some things that I have control over and an awful lot that I don't. And my only prayer is that I am somehow able to perceive the difference and let go of the things that I don't. I also, realize that there's a lot of people who don't believe in any kind of deity whatsoever. So here's the thing, you don't have to. You can just believe in your own higher self. The part of you that knows the difference between right and wrong without being told. You just know. The part of you that rescues a baby bird, even though you know full well that little creature will never be able to pay you back. It's the part of you that seeks the noble, the courageous, the decent, the caring. It's the part of you that forgives. It's the part of you that knows that only kindness matters. It's the part of you that loves unconditionally. That's the part that knows what your great quest is. Even if your normal everyday self doesn't. I just recently, like just this last week, discovered this book called The Great Quest by Charles Boardman Howells. It was a children's adventure novel published in 1921. So it would have been around when my parents were kids. And even though neither of them ever mentioned it, I wonder if at least one of them read it as a child and it influenced them as they were raising me. It's about a, a guy named Cornelius Gleason. Leeson, who returns to his hometown unexpectedly and talks a bunch of his childhood buddies into going on a quest to retrieve a buried treasure. And he also takes with him a local farmer that he himself is responsible for causing to be foreclosed upon on his farm in return for money that he uses to fund his quest. So he's a little, he's a little dicey. Anyway, and I know this is a spoiler, but the book hit, was published in 1921, so it's your own fault if you haven't read it yet. It turns out that Mr. Gleason has misled the entire group. It turns out that there is no buried treasure. The entire adventure, or shall I say misadventure, was a ruse to get people to help Gleason go to Guinea to capture native Africans there to sell into slavery. The actual protagonist of the story is named Josiah Woods. He goes by the name of Joe. This is actually his great quest because 
once he figures out what Gleason is up to, he he organizes the others to take over the expedition away from Gleason. And eventually, what ends up happening in Guinea is they rescue a white missionary's daughter and a, a native African companion, and their relationship is never really made clear from a, tr a rival tribe that means to do them both harm. And both of these folks end up accompanying the group back to Massachusetts. But the final sentences in the book is, a royal fortune may have been lost with Neil Gleason and in Gleason's mad quest. But I can say in all sincerity, that his quest, from his quest, I gained a fortune beyond my deserts. The book won all kinds of awards and truly it is amazingly astute and complex for a children's adventure. But the point is, Gleason was on his great quest, Woods was on his own. Hopefully they both came out better people at for the experience. Gleason, if I remember correctly, left Joe to die twice during the adventure. And even so, Joe saves Gleason at the end. However, Joe's uncle, who was also along for the ride, sadly died, leaving Joe an inheritance. So Joe's fortune was both material and spiritual. One hopes that Gleason lives long enough to face some sort of justice, but I am sure that that's this story, his story at the end was not the story that this story meant to tell. It is Joe that comes out for the better, wiser, and it turns out richer for it all. Another story like this is the movie, Mr. Holland's Opus. Mr. Holland is a high school teacher that wants to write a great symphony. He never succeeds, but again, spoiler alert, it turns out that his real opus, his real great symphony is all the young people who he helps to grow into better people along the way. Not everyone's great quest is to grow into better people. I get that. Some people's great quest is to have and raise great children who then in turn produce wonderful grandchildren and perpetuate the line. And that is a perfectly valid, great quest. And if that is your quest, that is your quest. I am supportive of that. Some people's great quest is create art or music. Some people's great quest is to be successful in business. Some people's great quest really is to make lots and lots of money. And that's okay too. The world turns on diversity. There is room for every person and every person's great quest is important. I would like to encourage you for this coming week to give some thought into what your great quest is. Now you can tell me you don't have one that you really are just here to take up space, but spoiler alert, I probably am not going to believe you. I'll probably laugh. I'll probably smile and say, okay, but I'm not really buying it. Look at the successes in your life as well as the failures, because they are all of equal value. But most of all, look at those fails that were not fails. Those contain the most valuable lessons at all. Mostly though, I hope you just enjoy the ride. This is your great quest and no one else's.
Our closing hymn now is Love Will Guide Us. Those in the sanctuary, sit back, close your eyes, and listen quietly. Like the cosmic dust following after a great Perse Perseid meteor, we are all living remnants of time and all that has come to pass in its wake, briefly shining lights on the way to eternity. We are only visible to the naked eye for an instant. Take this moment to shine like the stardust you are. May the light of our time on earth Shine to bless the world and each other. Shine, shine, shine. Namaste, amen, and blessed be. Thank you, Joan Dardamus, for sharing your valuable time and insights with us again this morning. It is sincerely appreciated and we look forward to seeing you again. We're going to have about 10 to 15 minutes of Q&A with Joan following the service. Please be aware this will be recorded on the video that is posted. Thank you for your patience as we try to transition into a audible Q&A. Is there anyone who has any questions or comments for Joan? Was that Marcus? Yeah. Marcus, did you want to come up here and so she could hear you? I think, yeah. Okay, Joan. Marcus has a question or comment for you. He's coming up. Hi. That's a great blessing. That the first time I come to Unitarian. Place I hear about Dungeons and Dragons. <laughs> I, I played for many years myself. And when I was looking through a list of people that were Unitarians, Gary Gygax appeared on that list. He I did not know that. Unitarian is, that. That I did not, I do not remember his quote, but he said he was an off brand of Unitarian. I thought I'd uh, mention that. <laughs> I did not know that. Uh, Thank you for sharing that with me. Thank you. Was there anyone else? At
Were you able to hear that, John? No. No. Oh. So maybe if you so could I'll repeat try to it. it. I, I think Pat Pat was saying that she had never thought of it as having a great quest. Is that what she said? Yeah. yeah. She she had never thought of it in that way. However, she did enjoy your talk and thank you very much. You're very welcome. It? <laughs> okay. Anyone else? Bill? Did you want to come up? Just a brief remark for me. Yeah, right, you're going to believe that. Um, Hi, Bill. Uh, just a brief remark, at least for me, it's every now and then you can sort of or lose that feeling of saying, I know what my quest is. Either you get too many of them or the light fades a little bit. I think sometimes that we age the most during those times because we're not getting that refilling flow that moves into things. Been like that a little bit with me lately. I'll try and work on that. Okay, that's about it. Thank you, Bill. It's good seeing you. Anyone else? Anyone online, maybe? Okay, so Adam has someone online. I'm not hearing anything. Yeah, Adam is looking, working through all our devices here. <laughs> Hello. Savannah, you had a question for us online? Yes, hello. Hi, Savannah. Hello, yes. Hi, um, it's more of a comment. I just thought it was interesting and exciting that we talked about um, what we did today because I'm beginning to read uh, Sacred Contracts by Caroline Miss and I'm really enjoying it and working with her archetype cards. And I think uh, it's just a sign to keep going and doing that, especially because this is my first experience at this type of church. I, I am so happy to have you. I hope you continue. Um, UUCR, the Riverside Church, it, it's, it's, I call it the big geek church. There is a lot of, I knew the Dungeons and Dragons would go over well here. I loved it. I loved hearing about it. Thank you. Anyone else? No? Okay. Thank you very much, Joan. I think we are all protagonists of our own stories and we need to follow our own, our well, own quest. Uh, thank you for having me. So Good seeing you, everybody. Have a great Sunday. Go forth and be mighty. Thank you.